أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يقولون أئنا لمردودون في الحافرة أئذا كنا عظاما نخرة قالوا تلك إذا كرة خاسرة فإنما هي زجرة واحدة فإذا هم بالساهرة رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله وصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد ونسجن ربي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته uh, Now we are uh, wrapping up the second passage of the surah The first of them was the oaths The second of them was a description of judgment day And how rapidly it comes And it's building on the image that was already painted by the, the, the oaths that were about the raiders that are coming in Now of the statements we read, يَقُولُونَ أَإِنَّا لَمَرْدُودُونَ فِي الْحَافِرَ يَقُولُونَ is in the present tense, can also be understood in the future tense, which is why the interpretation exists that this statement is going to be made on Judgment Day, alongside the fact that it could be something that people are saying as skeptics even now. The word رَدْ in Arabic, مَرْدُودُونَ is in the meaning of الرَّجْعُ وَالْعَوْدُ وَالْإِرْتِدَادُ الرُّجُوعُ فِي الطَّرِيقِ الَّذِي جِئَ مِنْهُ رَدْ actually means to go back where you came from. To go, to, to go back to the starting point. Rad also has the meaning of rejection. Meaning that we are, when you say, inna uh, lamardu duna fil hafira, human beings are actually accepting the fact that they're originally dirt. And they're going back into dirt. You know? And so their skeptical claim is when we're gonna be thrown into the hafira, which is to me the more, the even more interesting a word, uh, why Allah used the word hafira here and what, what it means. Hafara in Arabic is to throw dirt up. Or to dig dirt. Like, man hafara hufratan waqa'a fiha. The students know the expression, right? The, whoever digs a ditch, you know, he's the one who's gonna fall in it. You know, uh, so the, the idea that Quran even says, la yahiqul makru sayyi'u illa bi ahlihi. That's the way the, the Arabs have that saying, man hafara hufratan waqa'a fiha. But in any way, in the Arabic language, uh, summiya hafirul fars li hafrihi fi adwihi. They, they say in Arabic, the, the horse, its hoof is also called a hafir or a hafira because it, it digs into the ground. You know, and it leaves a footprint, an imprint into the ground. Wasamul qabr hafiran. They used to, one of the words for the Arab, for the, for the grave in Arabic is hafir from the same origin. Walladhi yahfir al qubur hafar. And the one who, who digs the graves, he's called a hafar from the same origin. As a matter of fact, uh, it's really interesting that from it came an expression in Arabic, an naqdu عند الحافرة. It's an old saying, which means the most expensive thing that they used to sell back in the day is a high branded horse. Which is still a pretty big deal. Nowadays horses sell for five, six million dollars. Like some of them, it's crazy. Right, so they, the most and Arabian horses are, are known around the world, right? So they used to sell very, very expensive horses, but they never sold them on credit. In other words, you can take my horse now and pay me in a month, na'a. So they would say, al-naqdu عند الحافرة, meaning, which literally would mean something else, but basically what it means is, until I see the cash, that horse is not taking a dash, is what, what that means. But what, what that means in the expression is, hafira is it's standing in the stable, and it's just standing there in one place, you know, plowing its foot. And until I see cash, it ain't moving from there. It's gonna keep on digging where it is. Okay? So, al-naqdu and al-hafira. So from it, there's a meaning that got developed in the usage of the Arabic language. ثم نقل استعماله إلا كل حالة أولى. Then its usage became anything that it's in its original state. Is hafira. So it has two implications. One of a whole. والأولى أن يستبق اللفظ دلالته اللغوية على حفرة القبر وعلى الحالة الأولى. It means two things: the the ditch of a grave, like from hafir, and the original state. And now understand the statement: إن لمرد دون في الحافرة. Are we really going to be thrown back? After you know, are we seriously going to be taken back into the ditch, into the original state? into the original state, al-hafira. This is the question that the skeptics of the akhirah are raising, or this is the terrible ac- realization, like kalla sayya'lamun, that they're arriving at when they, when they see judgment day ha- uh, happen. Nakhira, I told you, is decayed bones. I wanted to read some of the Arabic meanings of, for you too. Uh, an-nakhir bi ma'na al-bala, or bali. 
لكن نخرة أبلغ من ناخرة. The word we say كنا عظاما نخرة when we've decayed into when we when we've turned into decayed bones actually means hollow on the inside. The the word نخير الصوت ينبعث من شيء أجوف of a sound that comes out of a hollow item. So hollowed up, hollowed in bones, decayed bones. And that's why actually the nose is also called minkhar. One of the Arabic words for the nose is minkhar because the nose is hollow on the inside. Okay? Anyway, I wanted to highlight that because they're suggesting that we are going to be completely decayed and hollow on the inside. This is interesting because we aren't entirely hollow. We're not just made up of bones. There's a ruh Allah put inside. And they don't see that. They just see the physical body, which is something I talked to you about yesterday. And so they're saying when that's gone, what is left of us? There's no reason to think that there's going to be an akhirah. أَيْ لَا كُنَّا عِظَامَ النَّخِرَةِ قَالُوا تِلْكَ إِذَنْ كَرَّةٌ خَاسِرَةٌ They said, this is then going to be a very, it's a losing return. Literal translation, that is, in that case, that's going to be a losing return. The word qalu, as bint al-shatih correctly points out, is an extra verb. You already have yaquluna. Yaquluna a'inna lamarduduna fil hafirati, a'idha kunna idhaman nakhira, tilka idhan karratun khasira. وَكُلُّهُ مَقُولَ الْقَوْلِ مِنْ مِنْ فِعِلْ يَقُولُونَ So all of it goes back to they say, that's already been mentioned. But in this ayah, in the twelfth ayah, Allah said again, قَالُوا They said, تِلْكَ إِذَنْ كَرَّةٌ خَاسِرَةٌ And قَالُوا is in the past tense. And so it is as though on judgment day, they are saying, we were decayed bones, we weren't going to come back. And Allah says, remember when they used to say past tense? That when that, come on, that's gonna happen? Yeah, it'd be pretty bad if that happened. Like Allah is taking a, let me just again be silly with you. You know, in movies sometimes they take you into a scene from back in the day, like trip down memory lane, and the screen becomes wavy and then it becomes black and white because that was in the past, right? This is a transition in film to take you back in time, right? And that's actually something that in the, in the depiction and the narration of the Quran happens regularly. Like you're talking about something in the future, and all of a sudden you're going back. And these same people that are crying before Allah on Judgment Day, how did our broken bones and decayed bones come back together, are now being taken back and shown a scene where they were standing there saying, seriously, we're gonna be raised again? Oh, that's gonna be really bad. I'm, I'm terrified. Tilka idan karratun khasira, man. That's going to be a really bad, a really loss-filled return. They were making this statement sarcastically, and Allah is making them, in a sense, eat those words now. That's what's happening in this powerful speech. So you, you, you see, therefore, there's even sarcasm in the Qur'an. There's even Allah letting people know, this is how they will feel, this is how they will regret the same words that they say. Words have weight before them. And it's not just words have weight. By the way, the statement, تِلْكَ إِذَنْ كَرَّةٌ خَاسِرَةٌ is true. If in fact there is resurrection, if in fact there is judgment, if in fact there is hell for those who disbelieved, that is a very losing proposition. That second time around you're brought to life, which is what karra means, a second time around, you know, a second chance. When you're raised again, you're, it's a pretty bad losing chance. You're gonna be in serious trouble at that time. So the statement in and of itself is true. But a lot of times you say true statements sarcastically. Oh my God, that's so terrible. You know, I sounded like Trump for a second, but anyway. <laughs> it's terrible, terrible. فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ wahida. And then Allah says, no, Allah doesn't have to, resp- it's, it's, you know, look at the ayah on its own, and we'll, we'll look at what it means, but I want you to dig a little deeper too with me. فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ wahida. Zajr in Arabic is used for when animals are yelled at. So zajr al-kalb, fissawki or fissuq, when, uh, when uh, horses, dogs, animals misbehave, and the master says, ah! And the dog goes, ah! You know, that's what it does. That's called zajr. That scolding of an animal is called zajr. And from it you get, when you humiliate people, and you scold them, and you talk to them like animals, and you put them in their place, that's a person who is muzdajar. And that's actually when the messengers of Allah, people would say about them, وَقَالُوا مَجْنُونٌ muzdajir. You know, this, this person's insane. He deserves to be yelled at. Like an animal is hushed away. 
How, like an animal is silenced, you know? And so Allah uses that word, إِنَّ فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ It is only going to be one single scolding. Allah does not have to, you know, argue with these people and their obnoxious claims. Allah doesn't have to respond to every criticism they make, every joke they make. No, Allah just needs one scolding, and that's enough. And the ta is for lil marra, right? So the ta at zajratun, the ta that you hear is for a one-time thing, something that happens once. Like for example, in Arabic, when you say akl, it means eating, but aklatun is a single meal, one single meal, right? Marra or marrun is to pass by. Marratun is a single passing by, right? So when you add a tamar buta, this is for it's called bastar marra, something that happens only one time, okay? Sim, same, similarly like tamratun or other words, when you add tamar buta, it becomes one thing, right? He says zajratun. And so it's already one, but he says zajratun wahidatun. If he says zajratun, it's already wahida. It's already one. But he added, فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ wahida, As if to say, this is the kind of single scolding that shall never have to be repeated again. What he's referring to is the raising of them, إِذَا نُفِيخَ فِي السُّورِ نَفْخَةٌ wahida. That, that scolding through the horn, that scolding will be enough. Everybody will be silenced after that. There's not going to be any attitude left. There's not going to be any defiance left in humanity. And so he says, فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ wahida. It'll just be one call of resurrection. One scolding, a single scolding. And then, فَإِذَا Then all of a sudden, هُمْ sahira. All of a sudden they find themselves in the sahira. Sahira means a night in which they can't sleep. Laylatun sahira. فَإِذَا هُمْ بِلَيْلَةٍ سَاهِرَةٍ The word sahir is an adjective in the Arabic for the word layl. Like مَنْ سَهَرَ اللَّيَالِ سَهَرَ اللَّيَالِ Right? مَنْ بَلَغَ الْعُلَى سَهَرَ اللَّيَالِ وَطَلَبَ الْعُلَى سَهَرَ اللَّيَالِ Whoever wants to reach great heights spends nights sleepless. Sahira means the night that doesn't let you sleep. Like what you call a sleepless night? That's sahira. Well, what in the world does that suggest? It means that judgment day and the resurrection is not bright, it's dark. That we're in the darkness. That's why we're gonna need light on judgment day. That's the first thing it means. Also, night is associated with sleep, but this is a night in which there is no sleep whatsoever. Why isn't there any sleep? You know, there were so many interpretations of sahira. Bint Shatik mentions them. I won't give you the list. It's a long list. Of things that were, Sahira, Sahira could be in Jahannam, Sahira is the field where they will stand, Sahira is all these things. She says, go back to the language. It's not used like this anywhere else. It's used in the Quran in this particular way. Go to the word that the Arabs used to think about when they heard the word Sahira. Not what you think after Islam, what the people thought before Islam when they first heard it. And she argues, Sahira is a night when you're terrified and you can't sleep. By the way, the, the painting that was painted in the surah, you'll notice each one of these surahs is very picturesque, right? The painting was people were sleeping and then they got raided. Wasn't it? And when you get raided, what can't happen anymore? You can't sleep. We're like, oh, is there another wave? Is there another wave coming? Is there another radifa on the way? And so they're going to be standing there, just like the people who've been raided, in shock, and they're going to be in a sleepless night. They're going to find themselves in a sahira. It's actually playing off of the image that's already been painted of the people that were raided. Because on judgment day, the criminal shall be raided. And they will be, they'll be anticipating, where's the attack coming from? I can't sleep tonight. You know, when they know that the, that the judgment is coming, or the enemy is coming after them, and they know it's coming, but they don't know which direction it's coming from. And it's a nervous night of standing guard, and you know, you, you're just in shock the entire time. This is فَإِذَاهُمْ sahira. And from here, where we go is, is one of the most beautiful transitions in the Qur'an. Qur'an does not go from one subject to another without an agenda, without a purpose. I've tried to illustrate that to you multiple times. So far, it was about the shock of Judgment Day compared with the shock of being raided by, a, you know, by looters. All of a sudden from there, we end up in a place that you didn't expect at all. Part of the signature style of the Qur'an. What is it? هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Did the news of Musa ever reach you? إِذْ نَادَهُ رَبُّهُ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى When his master called him in the sacred valley, Tuwa, and Tuwa I'll explain a little later. إِذْهَبِ إِلَى فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ تَغَى Saying to him, go to the Pharaoh, he has rebelled. فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّى And go say to him, would you consider for yourself maybe some road to redemption? Maybe you want to better yourself as a person? Maybe you want to grow out of the darkness you're in? 
you know, improve yourself and become purified. وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَى رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَى Maybe on perhaps I can guide you to, towards your master. Maybe you'll become fearful of God too. فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى Thereafter, after giving him that message, he showed him the ultimate sign. الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى So he called it all a lie. Hey baby, stop it. It's bothering me. Yeah, that one. Yeah, the cute one. Okay. فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى I mentioned the staff and somebody started, you know, but it's not the other, it's the other عَصَى <laughs> So he called it all a lie and he disobeyed, meaning he disobeyed Musa alayhi salam. ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى Then he turned his back and made all kinds of efforts. فَحَشَرَ فَنَادَى Then he gathered, meaning he gathered his entire society, legions of people in front of him, stood on the balcony of his castle, and declared, فَقَالَ أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى uh, Then he said, I am your most supreme master. I am your sup- most supreme God. أَنَا رَبُّكُمُ الْأَعْلَى فَأَخَذَهُ اللَّهُ نَكَالَ الْآخِرَةِ وَالْأُولَى Then Allah made him into a warning, into a, a lesson that people will take heed from for those who will come at the end of times and even the earliest generations. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَعِبْرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى No doubt about it, in all of that, there's a powerful moving lesson for anybody who has fear. This passage was the story of Musa in, summer, in summary, isn't it? What is it doing here in the description of Judgment Day? Let me help you first understand this connection, then we'll go ayah by ayah. So like I told you my, my, my method, I gave you a brief translation to tell you what the passage is about. Now we try to understand how it's connected, and then we go into it ayah by ayah. So that's the step-by-step process. So the thing here is, that the, the Day of Judgment is when Allah will send His angels. And the angels will stand as armies to deliver the punishment against the people. The earth will rebel against the criminals. It will have rajifa, and there will be another wave. All of that horrible stuff is going to happen, you can't avoid it. Except, before Allah sends armies of angels to punish humanity and judge them, Allah sends them messengers, lovingly, mercifully, kindly, to give them that message softly, so they don't land themselves in trouble on judgment day. Let me just give you an appreciation of what's being said. A lot, you guys don't watch movies, so I always have to refer to things that, you know, because you're religious people, you live in Frisco. So, so, so here's the thing. You've got this movie, I'm not going to tell you which one, because I made it up. There's a movie, and there's this army that is about to attack a village. And one guy from the village comes out, just unarmed, stands in front of this army and says, if you know what's good for you, you'll turn around, repent, and from now on you'll give charity to those people you are about to raid and kill. And um, I'm giving, I'm just here to warn you, I, it's not me, I'm just here to warn you. I'm just letting you know, if you know what's good for you, otherwise you will be destroyed, and not one of you will survive. What is the response of that massive army standing in front of that one man? Oh yeah? will be destroyed by who? You and what army? Isn't it? You and what army? What is a messenger of Allah? He comes and tells a powerful people like Quraysh, he comes and tells a, a great king, maybe the greatest ever, Fir'aun, you better change your behavior if you know what's good for you, because you're about to be annihilated. And they're like, you're gonna warn me? Look at the language. A king is obeyed. A king is obeyed. And a king does not, you don't say about a king, a king disobeyed. You don't say that. What does Allah say about Fir'aun? فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى He called it a lie and he disobeyed. If you're calling, if you're saying Fir'aun disobeyed, it's like you're saying he's not a king, there's a king above him who he disobeyed. That's the language that's being used. Messengers come without armies. Messengers come without force. They just come with a message. But their armies are legions upon legions upon legions of angels. Who you better take heed from? Their armies are in the unseen. Who you better take heed from? There used to be two levels of warnings. Now there's only one left. Two levels used to be, in the messenger's own lifetime, these people will be destroyed. Now that that destruction is gone. But the other one is still there. Judgment day is coming, and those legions of angels are still waiting for you. They're still gonna come and judge you. 
take that warning seriously. Just because you don't see an army standing behind him, no force behind him to implement the authority, doesn't mean that it doesn't command respect. You know, human beings understand authority. We, and if we didn't, society wouldn't exist. I mean, I, I really appreciated what authority means when I went to, when I traveled to Singapore. Because in Singapore, when you land on the plane, it says, if you are caught with ill, so they say this in very nice language. You know, the flight attendants say you can take your seat belts off now and get your bags and you can start pushing each other, etc. When she says that, so she says, and if you're found with illicit drugs, you will be given the death penalty immediately. Enjoy your stay in Singapore. <laughs> I took my mosquito spray and put it in my friend's bag. Because, <laughs> you know, we're not friends anymore. Uh, so, 